Okay, we're up to the uh, last chapter of James now. So hopefully you're enjoying the study as we're going through James and as you read through it, it'll help you a bit more. So we'll just jump straight into it. James chapter 5, you can see here that the first part of James, chapter 5, is a warning to the rich. A warning to the rich. Go to, ma- go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Now, I don't think here that he's just condemning, condemning anyone that has riches, because there's nothing wrong with having riches. You know, the Bible talks about uh, people that are rich. You know, I mean, Job was obviously rich. He was a, an example of uh, suffering as well. Um, but Abraham was also rich. Many rich, many people in the Bible with riches, so that's not the issue. And as we see through later in the James chapter, we see the sort of rich men that is being condemned there in James chapter 5. But uh, look at the instructions here to people that do have riches, and that would probably include all, all of us. You know, we, we don't see ourselves as rich, but we have, you know, uh, the, I'm sure you've heard it a lot, that we're probably richer than you know, 80% of the world that live, uh, you know, um, under the poverty line. First Timothy 6, 17, look, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded. So you're seeing saying here, like sometimes when people are rich, they're successful, they're doing well, they, they become proud. And that's why, like last week we talked about, you know, when you do well in life, you ought to remember why you do well. You know, you do well in life because of the talents and the abilities that God has given you. It's God that gives you the power to get wealth. He opens and closes doors for you. And sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we do well and then we start lifting ourselves up and like King Nebuchadnezzar, you know, like look at this great kingdom that I've built. And, uh, you know, God had to humble him. That's why, you know, uh, we talked about last week, you want to humble yourself rather than lift yourself up because if you do God's job, he's going to do yours. Nor trust in uncertain riches. See, it's not that we're trusting our riches to get saved, but sometimes, you know, we trust in our riches that gives us stability. You know, it's our riches and material possession that gives us joy, you know, that makes you feel calm and things like that. You know, when things are going well, you feel okay. That's like putting your trust in riches because where, where, should, where should the source of your joy and your stability and your assurance and your peace come from? Should it come from your material possessions or should it come from the fact that God is good, that you're saved, that God loves you, that no matter what happens, you have a home in heaven? These are the things that your trust should be and not in uncertain riches, right? But in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. So here's the charge to rich people, verse 18, that they do good, right? So if you're going to make, if you're going to have money in this world, you're going to be successful, do some good with the material wealth that you have, rather than just be selfish with it. That they do good, that they be rich in good works. So you see how I'm saying, not just being rich in material possessions, they be rich in good work. May may your uh, additional income and resources enable you to do even more for God. Whereas sometimes when people are successful, they do less for God. Why? Because there's more things to be distracted with, isn't there? More things to enjoy. They, they get more success. God has blessed them with more and they do less for God. Whereas the Bible is saying here, hey, if you have more, then you should do good. You should be rich in good works whilst you're also rich in material wealth. Ready to distribute. What does that mean? It's you're generous with your money. Right? You're generous with your things, right? Rather than the rich fool just hoarding it all up just for himself to enjoy and to relax. Willing to communicate. So willing to communicate is just another way of talk. It's not talking about um, necessarily like conversa- you know, uh, like speaking. Um, we see in the Bible that like communicate is when you're sending funds over to other places as well. So willing. So there, this is kind of the same thing, like ready to distribute. So it's like ready to do good with your resources and willing to send it to others if need be. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. So you see how like the riches here, you're laying up treasures in heaven, like Jesus says, rather than laying up treasures in earth for the judgment day. Now, how does that compare to James? So let's continue there in James 5. And we see, you know, as we read through James 5, we see the, the sort of rich men that James is warning, right? It's unsaved, ungodly, worldly rich men, not just people that just have riches. So there's not 
there's not a, it's not a sin in and of itself just to have riches, right? But then there is a charge, like we looked in 1 Timothy 6, a charge to those that have riches, right? Your riches, so now we're going back to James 5, so this is talking about the sort of rich people that he's wanting. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered and the rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. So in verse 2, you know, James is alluding a lot to like the teachings of Jesus, right? Because when Jesus, you remember when he talked about lay up, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. So that idea of laying up, right? If you want to lay up treasures for eternal life, not lay up for yourselves treasures upon earth. Look, where moth and rust doth corrupt. So I don't know if you saw that link there. He says your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten, right? Your gold and silver is cankered and he talks about the rust. So you see how he's kind of alluding to this teaching of Jesus Christ where he says where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and still, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So reflect on that. You know, what you value in life is what, where your heart will be. You know, if you value riches, material wealth, worldly recognition, that's where your heart's going to be, right? So what should you treasure? You should treasure the things of God. You should treasure souls, right? The things that are not seen rather than the things that are seen. If you treasure the things that are not seen, that's where your heart's going to be too. And, you know, it's, it's all about your goals in life too. If you value the things of God, then it's going to redirect your life in that direction too. So what you value impacts the decisions you make in your life. Now in verse 3 in James 5, it says, Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. That's why he's talking about the rich that are ungodly, that are unsaved, obviously, because if you're not, if you're saved, then you're not, you're not going to be uh, burning in the flames of hell. So the ones that are wicked, these wicked, ungodly, rich, unsaved, and he's saying just like the rust, and it's interesting because you know, gold and silver are like those uh, metals that don't rust, right? Like we think of like gold and silver are those monetary metals that, you know, the whole idea of them holding their value is that they don't corrode, right? They hold their value over time and they don't rust and canker. And yet he's saying here, that gold and silver will canker. You know, you put your trust in these uncertain riches and even in these metals that you think don't corrode, but the rust of the gold and silver will be a witness against you and it's going to eat up that gold and silver just like the fires are going to, you know, corrode you in that sense. So he's warning them. You have heaped treasure together for the last days. Now, when I first read this, I thought, you know, is what he's condemning is he's saying, well, look, you're laying up treasures on earth. You know, and that's what you're doing wrong. You know, you, you, don't have your, you don't have your priorities right and you heap the treasure together in these last days that we're living in. I don't think that's what it's talking about. I believe what it's talking about is, you know, you can lay up the good sort of treasure so that on judgment day, you know, you, 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 you're doing the right things. But those that live ungodly, those that do not use their things right and then they're not saved, right? Because when you're saved... At least the punishment is being taken by somebody else, right? But if you live ungodly as an unsaved person, you are actually heaping up a greater wrath upon yourself. And that's what he's referring to there. You've heaped treasure together, but it's like the wrong type of treasure, right? It's the last days, which is when judgment comes and Jesus comes back. So we compare this to Romans 2, verse 5. It says here, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to every man according to his deeds. Right? So judgment day is God giving every man according to his deeds. So this is why when somebody lives ungodly and they don't get saved, right? they are treasurous, treasuring up themselves this wrath against themselves in the day of judgment, the day of wrath. But you know, we would be the same. Right? We would be the same, but thank God that you know, we have Jesus Christ. So that wrath that we build up on Judgment Day, Jesus Christ has taken. And that's why that's all that's left is what deeds we've done in order to earn rewards. We, we no longer have this. 
even though we still have sin in our life and it's building towards that, Jesus took it all when he died on the cross. Right? So that's the warning to the rich. Let's go on. We go on into verse uh, 4 to 6. So now we see the oppression of the poor by these ungodly uh, rich. Right? Behold, so behold means look, the hire of the laborers, so the wages that they're meant to pay their workers, who have reaped down your fields, doing all the hard work that, you know, that they, they, the rich men make money off, right? Which is fine. There's nothing wrong with having a business. But look, they're, they're oppressing them in the sense that they get them to work for them and then they don't pay them their wages. Which is, if you kept back by fraud, cry it. So it's interesting that it says, which is kept back by fraud. So you wonder what sort of fraud was going back on in the day. But maybe there's nothing new under the sun. You know, I, obviously I have more of like a political mindset. And I just think about all the fraud that happens between large businesses and and governments and you know sometimes people they say oh you know you can't have free market capitalism because look at what happens and just get corporations in bed with the government and things like that but that's not free market capitalism right free market capitalism is not when businesses are free to compete with one another when when corporations are in bed with the government that's what's called crony capitalism right the idea is not business is not meant to be able to harness the power of government to give them like a, a monopolistic advantage or an op oligopolistic advantage, right? So this is what I think of today, right? I don't know what was happening back then, but I'm sure there's very similar where, you know, they, they're maybe, you know, saying they you, know, you need to give it to the government, but then it somehow benefits them. And maybe it's the same here, like where people are basically taxed like 40, 50% of their income for all the hard work they get. And then it goes back, kickbacks to like the bankers and kickbacks to like the executives of all these corporations. So this idea that, you know, they're not getting their fair share of the wages of doing all the work and it's getting kept by fraudulent means, um, you know, and just think about other ways that the, 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 the governments nowadays steal from people, you know, like with inflation. Like that's fraudulent as well, where they're just like printing all this money and stealing from people, right? And taking all the money that they worked for, right? And they don't get to spend that money first into the economy. They just get it stolen from their savings and things like that. So which is of you kept back by fraud, cry it. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. So Sabaoth is not, I used to think this word was related to the Sabbath, the rest it's not. That word is just another word for like armies. So it's, it's similar to like when the, uh, I would say it's similar to when God is referred to like as the Lord of hosts. You know, he's the Lord of like, you know, the armies in heaven and things like that. So it's the same sort of word, just a different vocabulary. So the Lord of Sabaoth. <coughs> so the, the comfort here is that, you know, we don't live in a fair world. You know, those of us who aren't in those privileged positions where, you know, the rich are oppressing the poor and doing things to, to steal from them by fraud. But our comfort here is that God sees. You know, God listens. God hears the cries of them that are struggling, right? And they think they're getting away with it, but they won't. So their cries have entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. So this word here is not like wanting when you think like they've been you know, wanting, like uh, they're not, they're lacking. Wanton is when, they're, you're, when you're actually being quite indulgent. Right? So he's saying here, you've lived in pleasure on the earth, right? With these, these riches that you have got dishonestly and been wanton, you've been indulgent. You have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. What is that talking about? When day of slaughter meaning like they you know, kill an animal, you have a big feast. They're saying like, well, you're, you're eating like you're feasting all the time. Right? You have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You've always got way more. You know, like you're banqueting all the time. Like, like the Bible talks about like revelings and things like that. Just banqueting, just always living this indulgent, hedonistic lifestyle. Verse 6, Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. So this is the oppression. This is the ways that they oppress the poor. They're not paying their workers. We know God is watching. God's listening. They're living in indulgence. They get gain through unjust means. Right? Whether it's violence or whether it's fraud. And right now, God is not doing anything about it. Right? It says God, and He does not resist you. And sometimes we, we think that. We think, like, you know, a lot of people in the world think, oh, you know, there's all this evil in the world. Why doesn't God do anything about it? Well, 
the Bible says, like, yeah, you, you're getting, you think you're getting away with it all now, and right now he's not resisting you, right? Because, why? Because their judgment day is coming. You see, the wicked, they think they will get away with it. Now, I want to read, like, this large portion of Psalm 73. I, always, I go through this psalm with you guys every now and then, but it's a, it's a great psalm, because sometimes when you read through the psalms, they, they feel a bit random, right? But this one really feels like, this is a psalm that's written by Asaph, I didn't, I didn't take that first bit away, so that's actually not part of the scripture. Psalm of Asaph, this is the introduction. So Asaph was one of the singers in the Old Testament. So, you know, he's probably very close with David. Um, he's talked about in the Old Testament where he's like one of the main singers in the tabernacle and the temple and things like that. And uh, I feel like when you read this psalm, you really, you really get like, uh, you know, his heart as he's pouring it out in this psalm. And, and this thought of, you know, the world is not fair, and why does the, those that are wicked have it so easy? That, that sentiment really comes across in this psalm, and I, I hope you'll see that as we read through. It says, truly God, truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are, as are of a clean heart. But as for me, <clears throat> my, my feet were almost gone. So what is he saying? He's like, God is good, but he's like, gosh, I'm starting to... Starting to doubt God's goodness. My feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. Why, why was he starting to slip from believing God was good? For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death. What is he talking about? They don't go through, they don't go through hard times. They don't have struggles. Bands, like holding you back. Bands in their death. Their strength is firm. They are not in troubles as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride cumbers them about as a chain. Remember we talked about rich, the people that have it well, they lift it up, right? Violence covereth them as a garment, right? They do things by unjust means. Remember, you condemned and killed the just, right? He does not resist you. Their eyes stand out with fatness, right? They have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt, and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. So he's like saying, look at what they do. And they, they have it so good. They set their mouth against the heavens. Right? They even blaspheme God. They, and their tongue walketh through the earth. When I think of that, I think about like, their, their influence. When it says their tongue walk about the earth. It's like their influence throughout the world. And it's like today with the internet, they're influenced even more, right? They're, you know, Shorts and TikToks or whatever go about. Therefore, his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, How doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Right? So he's like, Look, this is what that is. He's like, does God do anything? Does God even know? <laughs> it happens. Right? Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. What is he saying here? It's, it's, it's such a sad psalm. Because he's, well, you know what he's saying? He's just like saying, I, like, I feel like it was like pointless to live a godly life. That's what he's saying there. I've cleansed my heart in vain. So he's like, why am, I, why am I trying to live a godly life when they don't live godly and they've got it so good? For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. See, I don't, he's saying, I don't live an easy life. If I say, he says, if I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. He says, but if I speak the things that I'm thinking, I'm not gonna, he knows that that's not a good example to the next generation. Verse 16. <clears throat> and when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. So it's when I think about this, I just, I can't, I can't handle it. So he's saying, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. So what's the problem? He's away from God. He's basically saying, then I went to church and I got my perspective right and I understood why it's that way. Right? Then understood I their end. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places Thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation? As in a moment, they are utterly consumed with terrors. Right? So this is this idea here, right, in James, where, you know, hey, the rich, they're oppressing the poor, there's fraud, 
they're violent. You don't think God is resisting them now. Maybe he's not resisting them now, but when you understand their end, it's not something to be envious of, right? We ought to be like ASAP, get our minds right, understand God is good, and that it's not vain to be always abounding in the work of the Lord, okay? So how should we, how we should respond? Right, well, go on. James uh, 5 verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, right? Get rooted and grounded in the faith for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Right, so have that eternal perspective. Live for the coming of the Lord for eternity. You know, that's what we should be doing right so one thing is we be patient so remember that patient is not just well i'm just going to wait and do nothing no right remember patience means to endure to continue to toil when it says the husband man waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it i mean when you think of a farmer you don't think of somebody that's just sitting around doing nothing I mean, that's somebody that's working hard, laboring and toiling. But he's saying he's waiting for the precious fruit of the earth, had long patience for it. It means he gets to work. And he just keeps working hard, working hard, working hard, and then he knows judgment day is eventually going to come and he will reap, as well as, you know, those who have made life hard in this world are, are going to get their, uh, what's coming to them. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Right, So it's not just about being rooted and grounded in church, but it's having the right perspective too because if you believe the right things the right way, then you won't be taken away like Asaph was sharing in that Psalm 73. You know when he says, like, my steps started to slip, I started to think these bad things, then he got his, got his head screwed on right, if that makes sense. So establish your hearts. One way you establish your heart is you need to be reading your Bible, be in church, things like that. Okay, so one is... <laughs> You know, we be patient. And that means we continue to endure, continue to toil, right? We don't have to take matters into our own hands. We can trust that God will do something. And I've shared this verse again before, I'll share it again. Romans 12, 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. So this is why he's saying you just need to focus on doing what's right, continuing to endure, continuing to work for God. Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So we can take great comfort in that, right? That all the evil that's going on in the world, God is seeing it, God will, will not forget it, and he will repay, saith the Lord. So one thing is, we don't, the way we should respond is, we, we, we just focus on keep, keeping on doing what's right. We don't have to try and get even, right? With the wickedness in this world. We just try and do what's right. Another thing is, is you don't want all the hard things going on in your life to make you turn against one another, right? James 5, 9, Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. So we don't want to turn against one another either. And we, we talked about that in another chapter of James. We said, speak not evil one another, brethren, because you speak evil of the law, you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. So he's saying the same here. But, don't, but he's saying, I think in the context of James 5, it's like these evil people are doing wicked things. Hey, make sure you understand who the enemy is. You don't grudge against one another. Don't turn on one another just because life is hard. You know, life is sometimes hard because of the evil people in the world and we should have a common enemy rather than making enemies of ourselves. Right? So it also applies to you know, personal vendettas, right? Not just commercial ones as well. Don't let it make you turn on one another. Let's continue. James 5. Take my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job, and you have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. So now we're getting here in these two verses encouragement from the Old Testament. Right? And, and, and this is one way the Bible encourages, when you have characters in the Bible that, can, that you can relate to. Now, Job is the one he's talking about here. here. 
And you know, the funny thing is, is people, one of the big objections to Christianity is people say, oh, you know, how can God allow all this pain and suffering in the world? You know, and, and to even believers. And, and this is why Job is in the Bible. You know, I think that's this is one of the big reasons is that we can look at Job and we can say he's one of the, he's one of the most righteous men living on the earth in those days. And totally unprovoked, he is living a really hard life. You know, he gets everything taken away. And, you know, what's the lesson there? The lesson is that, you know, God is molding him through that. And, and not all the things even came from God. Uh, you know, the devil was trying, trying to attempt, or God was trying to test Job using the devil's uh, sort of bad intentions on him, right? So characters in the Bible, you know, can make your problems seem smaller. You know, when you, when you think about Old Testament examples, so you think, oh man, I've got it so hard in life. You know, Job had it harder. You say like, I'm being persecuted for my faith. Well, were you hung on a cross upside down like the Apostle Peter? You know, we, we resisted unto blood. You know, maybe, maybe somebody ridiculing you on Facebook is not that bad. You know? Um, you say like, oh, you know what? You know, temptations in the world. So I can handle all the temptations. Like if I was rich and successful and powerful, I could handle it. Or could you? I mean, Solomon couldn't handle it. You know, that, that turned his heart away from the Lord. So... When you think about these Old Testament examples, you know, it, it, they can make your problems seem small, they can make you relate, they can encourage you. And here, obviously, the patience of Job. Right, remember, the patience of Job, suffering, affliction, and patience. Again, patience is not just waiting, it is enduring through the hard times. Okay? Now, something interesting here in verse 11, he says, Behold, we count them happy which endure. What does it, what does it mean by that? What I think it means is that when you see people in the Bible go through these struggles and everything, and you see them overcome, you, like, you cheer for them, right? You're like, oh, that's great. You, know, you count them happy, which endure. But do you think that same for yourself? You know, that, hey, these people are going through these trials and they overcame, you know? So it puts it in perspective when you go through hard times yourself. All right, we count them happy, which endure. All right, let's continue. Verse 12, but above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay nay, lest you fall into condemnation. So we're talking about how we respond to this oppression that's going on in the world. We're talking about being patient, knowing God is, is listening. You know, don't turn on each other. You know, we want to look to the Old Testament passages to be encouraged by people that have gone before us and, 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 and examples we see in the Old Testament. And also here, I think as well, that Sometimes when people, you know, maybe going through hard times or they, they want to avenge, you know, oppression that's going on in the world, they, they flippantly make oaths. And I think this is what he's saying here. You don't want to be flippant about the way you make oaths and, you know, don't just, don't just swear yourself to anything, especially by heaven or by earth, right? So, so there's, not, there's nothing wrong with making oaths in and of themselves. I mean, an oath is just a promise. You know, when you get married, you're like making an oath. So this is not saying don't make oaths at all, but I think what James is alluding to here is not just making flippant oaths, but one thing that is condemned in the Bible is not making oaths by things that don't belong to you, right? Like swearing by heaven, swearing by God, swearing by the earth. And we'll look at that here because Matthew, um, Jesus teaches on this. In Matthew 5, verse 33, again, you have heard that it has been said, by them of old time, thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, swear not at all. So he's not saying here, never make an oath. He's saying, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Because I believe what's going on here is people keep swearing by these things, swearing by Jerusalem, swearing by the temple, swearing by the heaven, swearing by earth. You know, rather than just making a promise, right? Like your yay be yay and nay, yes, I'm going to do this, right? Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. So you're saying, you don't even put your, swear by your own body, right? Because what? You don't own your body either, right? It belongs to God. So that's why he's saying, like, when you make a promise, just say, yes, you're going to do it. You don't have to swear by something, right? Let your communication be yay, yay, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. 
So why, why, why do they not swear by these things? Because it's not there. See, later on in Matthew 23, he condemns the Pharisees, right? Because they were swearing, like, kind of, we'll, we'll read here and you'll see. It says, Well, unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. Right? You see, so they're swearing by the temple uh, of, the, uh, of, of God. But they're saying, But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. So they're sort of like putting the gold of the temple higher than the temple itself, because if they swear by the temple and they don't keep it, that's fine. But if they swear by the gold that's in the temple, now they're, they're a debtor, they have to keep it. They're like putting up the gold of the temple, even greater than the temple itself. He falls and blind. For whether is greater, the gold? Or the temple that sanctifieth the gold? And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing, but whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. All right, so this is what they're doing. So you can see that they're, they're just lifting up things that shouldn't be lifted up, and then they're swearing by things that are not even there. He falls in blind, for whether is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctified the gift. Whosoever therefore shall swear by the altar, swear, sweareth by it and by all things thereon. And whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it and by him that dwelleth therein. So they're saying, like, you, you need to understand that if you swear by the altar, you're also swearing by the gift. So that's why don't swear by the temple, because God dwells in that temple, and you shouldn't swear by God. And he that's, that shall swear by heaven sweareth by the throne of God and by him that sitteth thereon. So you, you know, it doesn't mean that it's wrong to make promises, right? This is not what the teaching is here, is that they're swearing by things that don't belong to them, and they're also, they're all sort of swearing on behalf of God, which we shouldn't be, right? We shouldn't do that on behalf of God or by God's things, right? And this is what they were doing wrong, right? So don't get this idea that it's wrong to make promises. Prom there's nothing wrong with promises. It's swearing by things that don't belong to you, right, that, that you shouldn't be swearing by. So that's some ways how we should respond. Another way is obviously prayer, but I wanted to put this into its own section because it spends quite a bit of time on prayer. So the next section we're going through is verse 13 to 18, and then there's two more verses. The power of prayer. The power of prayer. James 5, 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. So this is another way you should respond to, you know, oppression and hard times is you're afflicted, you pray, you know, but you should also sing, right, to keep yourself happy if you're married. Right, so pray and praise God if you're going through hard times. It reminds me of 1 Thessalonians 5. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So you can see how that, if they go through hard times, it is a similar vein here, right? You don't end, render evil for evil, but you rejoice evermore, you pray, and you give thanks for all things. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Verse, verse 14 and 15. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil, in the name of the Lord. Now, this is something where people ask, so is, this a, is this a New Testament practice? I believe it is, right? So I remember asking um, my sending bishop about this and saying, like, did you ever do this? You know, did anyone ever ask you to come pray for them? And I said, like, what oil did you use and all that sort of stuff? So I remember he just said, yeah, he would just bring a bottle of oil and just put it on his hands and just pray for them. So I do believe this is a New Testament um, practice that if somebody is sick, and they want additional prayer that they can call for the elders of the church and then we can pray for them. So it's sort of something, it's not something necessarily for the elder to do, to just go around praying for, praying over everyone that's sick because it's, it's, I think it's a measure of the faith of the person that's actually sick, right? For them to actually call to have prayers for them. So you see here it says, any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So I, I do believe this is something that is for New Testament church leaders. Um, it's something that's requested by the church member. Now, it says here, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick 
So I think this is talking about like a, like a physical, obviously from the sickness, being saved from the sickness, not saying it's going to save, give the salvation to the person that's sick, right? And the Lord shall raise him up, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. So the way I think you should rightly understand this, this is not saying that this is the way that sins get forgiven, like we have this mediator. I think it's just a promise to say, yeah, and any sin that he has will be forgiven too. But I think the reason why it's mentioning these sins in line with sickness is because sometimes our sickness is caused by our own sins, <laughs> right? So I think it's like if he's it's saying here that the Lord will heal them, right, of their sickness, and also any, if, if sins were the reason why that sickness exists, the sins are also forgiven too, right? Not that it's the prayer and the anointing that forgives them, it's, it's when the Lord responds to us. It's the Lord that is healing and forgiving um, those sins. And it makes me think of 1 Corinthians 11. We read this every time we do communion, but maybe just to remind you, verse 29, for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So see how they were not practicing the Lord's supper correctly in 1 Corinthians 11. For this cause, look, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. So you see how weakness and sickliness can be caused by a person's sin as a chastisement on their life from God. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. So you say, hey, if you sometimes spend some inward reflection and get it right, you know, and judge yourself, you're not going to be judged by God. But when we are judged, when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. So he's saying you know, we may be judged by God, but we're not going to be condemned to hell if we get punished for our sins from our loving Heavenly Father as a chastisement. Right? So that's why I think James 5 also ties in this sins being forgiven. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. So one thing is I want to point out here is notice that it, he's not just saying that the elders pray for people. Yes, people can call for the elders of the church and, and pray for them. But look, you can also pray for one another that you may be healed. You see, so sometimes people get this idea that like the prayers of church leaders have more weight than others like like we are like like a, a little like mary like a mary in the catholic church you know and you, and you come to me for mediation to god because you can't pray to god yourself you can't pray for one that's not the case right this is just exhortation everyone prays for each other church leaders can come and pray for them there's a certain practice there but you can pray for one another as well that you may be healed the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It's not just an effectual fervent prayer of church leaders availeth much. It's the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Anyone that tries to live according to God's laws, tries to live a righteous life and prays for one another, their prayers are just as effective or even more effective than somebody, even if they're in church leadership, right? And it kind of reminds me of, um, you know, just saying here, I just want to share this, 1 Timothy 2, to remind you that you can pray to God directly. You don't need a mediator. There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So just like the Catholic doesn't need to go to Mary to go to God, right? you don't need to go to your church leader to go to God either. right? You've got one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Look what Hebrews 4 says, about our mediator, our high priest, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Verse 16, look at this. Let us therefore, so remember therefore, why is it therefore? Let us therefore, because, of, because we have this high priest, Jesus, the Son of God, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You know, sometimes Christians, you know, have a thought like, you know, well, if God doesn't listen to me. Like, well, if I pray, well, can I go to God? Well, the Bible says here, you have the high priest, you've got the mediator, Jesus Christ, you can come boldly unto the throne of grace, right? You have now, as that child of God, you have Jesus Christ as your mediator, you can go to God for help. 
that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You don't need a mediator. You've already got the one mediator, Jesus Christ. Right? The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man of much. Verse 17, Elias, so Elias is uh, Elijah. It's just the uh, Greek alliteration of Elijah. I think uh, Elisha is Elysius. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. What does that mean? It's saying, hey, he had the same struggles as we did. And when you read through Elijah's life, you know. I mean, he had some down, very down. He wanted to kill himself. Remember? He wanted to die. So he knows. He experienced the highs and lows of life, the mountains and the valleys. Elias, he's saying, hey, Elijah was like us, where he experienced highs and lows. And he would have experienced much higher highs, but he also experienced much lower lows, right? Where he had a whole nation after him. You know, Jezebel looking to kill him. He prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. So it's just giving an example here of what prayer can do. Right? And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. So Elijah here is being used as an example of prayer, just like Job is being used as an example of suffering. Right? And you, know, you should sometimes as well be familiar with these Old Testament stories so that you can find encouragement. You know, sometimes you find yourself in a situation, you think, well, you get reminded of these stories and it encourages you. This is how God's word encourages you, but you have to, you have to know it, otherwise it's not going to encourage you if you don't know what the Bible's talking about. All right? Now, the last two verses, James 5, is we look out for one another. So we confess our faults to one another, pray for one another. And just one thought on that passage, actually. I'll just go back there. Because uh, I just want to, <laughs> you know, confess your faults one to another just doesn't mean that you just tell everybody. Do you know what I mean? Like, so, you know, you, you want to have some wisdom in, you know, obviously in a church there's going to be people you're closer to, people you trust more than others and things like that. So this is not just, you know, airing your dirty laundry to everybody because obviously you, you may end up getting hurt if somebody does not treat your things that are sensitive with the right sort of respect. So, you know, when it's saying confess your faults one to another, just, just be wise about who you confess your faults to so that you don't, it doesn't come back to bite you, right? Usually relate, people that you build relationships up with and things like that. I think it's common, but I just wanted to make that point there that that's not just saying you, you are ob obligated to just tell everyone your deepest, darkest, most innermost struggles, right? Now, last bit, look out for one another. Last two verses, brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Now, I think there's two applications here. Um, you know, you can apply this one to salvation, right? So you could sort of say, you know, and, and one thing we should do, you know, we make sure each other's saved, right? You know, if somebody says something you think doesn't sound right, you know, you understand... You know, salvation, you think somebody doesn't understand salvation, you don't want to just take for granted that just because people go to the same church as you that they're necessarily saved. They may not be saved. I mean, people can go to church for a long time and not be saved, right? Or not really get it. Hopefully in this church they, they do because salvation is preached quite clearly and, and not in a confusing way like in other churches where they keep telling you it's salvation by grace but every other sermon they're telling you if you don't have works, you're not saved. That's very confusing. Um... But what I think it's, it's talking about primarily is just somebody erring from the truth, like in, in the faith, trying to like going off into sin, right? Because it's talking about praying for not one another, looking out for one another, you know? And, and we talked about you know, people being sick and then being healed, and sometimes their, their, their sins, like we talked about, is the reason why they have struggles and have things like that in their life. So this is why he's saying, hey, if any of you do err from the truth, this is not just talking about salvation, it's just going down the wrong path. And this is why I've talked about this, is, is look out for one another. You know, it's not just my job, only my job, to think about people's spiritual welfare. You know, we need to be looking out for one another. And that's why when it says confess your faults one to another, it's not just confess your faults to the bishop, like in the Catholic Church, where it's like, it's just one way, Right? In the New Testament church, like, we are all priests, right? So we can all help one another. We can all encourage one another. 
So here too, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, right, sort of get him back on the right path, let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death. So it may not just be talking about hell, it's just saying like going down the wrong path. And, you know, sometimes I think when we live quite a prosperous, quite a privileged life, we don't really think about how hard life is for the majority of people. Right? And sometimes, you know, we think the error of our way is like, you know, you just skip church on a Sunday. And you're like, how am I going to die from that? But then in life, like, you know, people, they, they go down the wrong path. They go down alcohol. They go down drugs. They hang around with the wrong people. You know, they, get, they, they, they can get themselves into a lot of trouble. And that's why he's saying here, you know, if you, can convert, if you can reach out to them and get them back on the right path, you might actually save their life. Convert the sinner from the error of his way, shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. So sometimes it's not only their own sins, but also the knock-on effect of all the damage sin does. Right? So he's saying here, look out for one another, because look, if you can keep each other on the right path, you can save yourself from a lot of hurt and from a lot of sins. Okay? Galatians 6. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Okay, so that's the last thought I'm going to give you from James 5, is, you know, look out for one another. You know, you know I know we're all focused on trying to live our own lives and things like that, but you want to also take a moment to make sure, you know, obviously you need to be trying to live right first, but then look out for one another. You know, be considerate of one another. You see somebody struggling or, you know, that's why it's important to be friends with one another because then that makes that all the more effective. Okay, so I hope you learned something. So, you know, I think what you should do, you know, we've gone through James over the last five weeks. If you've missed one, you can go back and listen to it. They're on YouTube. Um, but, you know, now, read through James. You know, when you read through it on your own, you, know, you may even pick up something that I didn't mention. But I think now that you read through it, it's going to stand out to you a lot more. And think about what you've learned over the past few weeks. And you know what you should do? Put something into practice. You know, James is a perfect book to remind you of that because you don't want to be a, doer of the word, uh, a hearer of the word only and a doer. So I think now that we've gone through James, a good time, hey, in your own time, read through James, think about what you've learned, think about how it applies to you, and make sure you do something so you don't just forget all the lessons you've learned over the last five weeks. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the book of James, and, and pray, Lord, that it's been practical instruction for the church here. Pray that it edifies them. Help us not to be just hearers of the word. Help us to be doers. And help us, Lord, as we learned in James 5, to, to look out for one another respond in the right way, and Lord, be patient, not just waiting, but be busy doing the right thing. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.